Well, good evening, everyone. Our friends at St. Joseph's and Grand Junction, hope you're having a good evening. Well, this is our last endeavor on, on, the, person, <clears throat> on the person of uh, Jesus as seen in the Gospel of St. Mark. Well, we've covered a lot of stuff. Uh, the issues that are timely uh, with Jesus, uh, his relationship uh, with the scribes and the Pharisees, the issue of healing on, uh, healing on the Sabbath, being Lord on the Sabbath, driving out demons, curing the multitudes, um, all sorts of issues of preaching and teaching, those five points. He brings about the gospel of God, this is the time fulfillment, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe. And then, the, of course, the accusations against Jesus. Jesus, the reason why you're doing this, but ultimately you, you are in link with Beelzebul or Satan himself. And then this morning we covered the issue well, uh, the, issue, the issue of uh, the uh, synagogue illegal uh, uh, Jairus, who has a daughter that's dying, and then the woman with the hemorrhage, uh, and then again, the little girl's 12, the woman with the hemorrhage is suffering horribly for 12 years. Uh, again, there is a mark and conflation. You have two separate events that are combined by the gospel writer Mark to indicate some sort of meaning. And of course, uh, both have the issue, one is dead and one is suffering horribly and they both wish to be made well that they might live. And that is a resurrectional theme found in Mark's gospel. The issues that got Jesus on the cross are multiple. In Mark's gospel, the issue of prophecy, the role of prophecy, the role of the Messiah, which we covered yesterday, when he goes to Nazareth, he announces that he's a long awaited Messiah. Okay, by quoting the book of the prophet Isaiah. The issue of Torah, the issue of Sabbath, the issue of kosher, <clears throat> and what are the messianic expectations that Jesus, at least in the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible, Jesus has to fulfill. Tonight, we get into two specific issues, the one dealing with ritualistic defilement or kosher, and then the issue of healing, the last healing. Of all the things that got Jesus into all sorts of difficulties was the one of kosher or ritualistic defilement. The premise is this, the, the physicality of the world, even though made by God, okay, there are certain things in the universe by its very nature are arch contaminating. They lead to defilement. You're in the state of ritualistic impurity. Doesn't mean that you're in the state of sin, but that you have taken onto yourself by ingesting or, or, or touching uh, that which is by its very nature intrinsically unclean. So shellfish, uh, pig meat, uh, anything like that, so what you can taste, touch, and handle. Kosher deals with, with what you can taste, touch, and handle, and what you cannot taste, touch, and handle, okay? So things from the outside taken into you defile you. That is ritualistic defilement. Jesus has a certain understanding of that. There's a whole question about, the, does Jesus and his teaching Ascribe to the attitude of Torah of his day? Does he change Torah? Does he modify a certain interpretation and application of Torah? What does he do? It, is Jesus Torah observant? Well, in most cases, he is. He is that faithful Israelite because he is the word. The Torah given by God but articulated through human speech and human beings, this word of God, we believe, took flesh in the incarnation. So there's no dichotomy or contradiction between the books of scripture or the books of Torah or the Ten Commandments 
and Jesus. They are one and the same. You're dealing with, with a different modality, that's all. But it's the same word of God. And this I've talked about time and time again. So the word of God that Genesis has Abraham hearing, which is the means by which God calls Israel as his very own possession, as his very own people by covenant in, in Genesis chapter 17, that voice that Abraham heard is the exact same voice or word of God that Moses hears in the burning bush in Exodus chapter three. And the same word that both Abraham and the prophets and Moses heard, we believe took on flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. So there's absolute continuity here. The problem now is Jesus being the word of God, can he modify or somehow nuance the historical articulation of his word as seen in Torah? That is the issue. That's the issue. So let's get to it. Okay, this is Mark chapter 7, 1 through 23. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered round about him, let's stop there right now. Uh, these are the head theologians of his day. They come from Jerusalem. <clears throat> they come from the theological seat of Israel, the, the theocracy of Israel. These are the theologians, not since some backwater rabbi, no. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes would come from Jerusalem, these are the big guns. We are going to have a real conflictual relationship here. It's not going to be good. I'll just tell you that right off the bat. Gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. You see, there were certain issues of cleanliness that were absolute and that had to be done. Okay. And then Mark, since he's not necessarily writing to a Jewish audience, he defines what kosher is. So in verse three, there is a parathetical phrase. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash thoroughly their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders and they do not eat anything from the market unless it is washed first. And there are many other traditions that they observe the washing of cups and pots and bronze kettles. And that ends the parathetical phrase. Uh, there are levels of theological certitude and theological mandate. There's the written Torah, and then the oral Torah, okay? Halakha, Mishnah, Haggadah, Gomorrah. That's the oral Torah. Linked with the written Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Both are called the Torah, double Torah. The written Torah, the oral Torah are of divine originality. They are of divine commission and so therefore of divine origin. They're not of human origin. They are of divine origin, but articulated through human beings. Okay, you got that? That's crucial. Okay, then there is the tradition of the elders. So that's the next step. <clears throat> there is a whole uh, accoutrement of theological insight and data and reflection, discernment and interpretation in the religion of Israel where rabbis, Torah scholars, the sages of Israel made a commentary on both the written and oral Torah. That was the tradition of the elders. And this is what the Pharisees stood for, the tradition of the elders. The, the tradition of the elders was not a divine origin, but of human origin. Okay, you keep that in mind. And then there was, rabbinical law, which is another level of theological certitude and application as it derives its authenticity from the written and oral Torah. 
So there are levels of theological certitude and application. Kosher and the way they lived kosher was of absolute importance for the Jew. Why? It set them, it set them apart from the Gentile. What you were to eat, what you were, what you were not to eat, what were you to touch, what, what you could you touch, how, how you clothed yourself, how you bathed yourself. It was everything. Okay? And so the object was to separate from yourself from anything that by its very nature was arch defiling. So the physicality of the universe, creation, the world uh, taken into you could in fact either make you pure or impure. That is kosher, which you can take, touch, and handle. So now Jesus is going to give a very interesting application and interpretation of defilement. So in verse five, so the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? That is the problem right there. Jesus, you're a rabbi. Of course, you haven't studied formally, nor did you get delegation from us, but you have disciples. That's fine. Keep your disciples in line. Why aren't you fulfilling the tradition of the elders? Remember Jesus, non-observance of Torah, both written and oral Torah, non-observance of rabbinical law, non-observance of the tradition that brought us into existence leads to disbelief, leads to non-observance. And when you are non-observant of Torah, both written and oral, and the facticity and the veracity of the tradition of the elders as expounded by the Pharisees, you run the risk of non-belief. And what happens when we don't believe? What happens when we allow intermarriage? What happens when we, when we allow, because of our wives, pagan customs coming into Jerusalem, coming into Ares Israel, the land of Israel? And so that people start to uh, adopt pagan, Gentile, religious activities in our land, which is dedicated to God. That's apostasy. We can't allow that. And when you, Jesus, as a rabbi, do not correct your disciples and, and do not live according to the tradition of the elders, your disobedience, i.e. your disbelief, can lead us into exile again. And we don't want to go through that. We don't want to lose our nation, and we don't want to lose our temple. And of course, both are lost back in 70 AD. Because again, from a Christian perspective, Luke uh, and Luke wants to say, uh, not, not necessarily Mark, but Luke wants to say, because you're unable to recognize the time of your visitation, the time of the visitation of the Messiah, who's Lord of all, God allows you to go into exile by the destruction of the temple and the ending of the theocracy of Israel. So that's the issue here. So they're saying, why don't you correct your disciples? And just like the Sabbath, are you apostatizing from the religion of Israel? What are you doing, Jesus? And Jesus said to them, and he quotes Isaiah, the book of the prophet Isaiah, uh, chapter 29, verse 13. And he said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly of you hypocrites. This is not going to go well. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as hu mere human precepts, doctrines. Your understanding of truth, your understanding of theological certitude, your understanding of God's law, you have corrupted it. Your hearts are far from me. The Torah lives in the heart. Your heart. And, and, and again, he's quoting Isaiah. And Isaiah is warning the people of your hardness of heart because you stopped 
being observant of Torah. You stop believing the truth and you, you go out after other false gods that really don't exist whatsoever. There's people honor me with their lip. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you pay liturgical lip service, but your hearts are far from me. You really don't believe. And then do you worship me? Because you also worship Asherah, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You are teaching the tradition of the elders and treating it like it's divine revelation. The tradition of the elders is not Torah. It derives its essence from Torah and it, and it explicates Torah, but it's not Torah. It gets worse. Verse eight, you abandon the commandment of God and hold fast to human tradition. This is deadly. This is Jesus just, just giving it to them. It's not going to go well. Then he said it then, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And whoever speaks evil or father of mother, let him surely die. But you say, elders, tradition of the tradition of the Pharisees, but you say, if anyone tells father or mother, whatever support you might had from me is now Korban, that is dedicated to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for father or mother, thus making void the word of God through your tradition that you handed on. And you do many things like this. Let's, let's, let's take that apart. Okay. The commandment, honor your father, your mother. Okay. That's that. That's part of the Torah. That's part of the Ten Commandments. And you are to do that. that. That's not an option. Now, how you honor it, that's another issue, but it is not an option. So let's say a uh, Jewish couple has children and some of the children don't get along with their parents. And But under Torah, you are to take care of your parents as they grow older. But let's say that you don't want to do that. Let's say that you've had a bad relationship with your parents and you don't want to take care of them, but you do have, in fact, the financial wherewithal to do so, but you don't want to do it. So what do you do? Ah, I will take the money that would have been offered from my parents for their welfare and give it to the temple as votive offerings so that the money that I would use to help mom and dad is now dedicated to God. It's Korban. And because it's dedicated to God, there is no further obligation to obey the commandment, honor your father and mother by providing for their economic sustenance. A human tradition has just nullified the word of God. And Jesus will have nothing to do with that. This gets very nasty. Okay. And then now Jesus is going to give a definitive understanding of kosher. Let's get to it. And you do many things like this. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. He's like most. He's saying, I want you to listen to me, not them. Listen to me. And I want you to listen and understand. And, and in the Hebrew mind, when you hear the word of God, that means you're listening to it so that you have understanding of the presence of God's word in your heart. Because that's where the Torah lives. Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out are what defile you. He's just done away with ritualistic kosher, not moral kosher. I'm making a separation here. Verse 17. 
When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he, uh, and, at, and at this point, it must have been a very heated discussion. Then he, then he said to them, are you also without understanding? You know, just say, we're just asking a question. Are you also without understanding? Do you not see? This is Jesus speaking. Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile? since it enters not his heart, where the Torah lives, but enters his stomach and goes out into the, and goes out into the latrine. And then Mark has that infamous parathetical phrase, thus he declared all foods clean. For the Jew, that's heresy. So one of the things that got him into all sorts of, thus he declared all foods clean. That's Mark saying. Mark's adding that, that whole interpretive understanding of Jesus. There, there, there is a practical application here. Thus he declared all foods clean. What does it mean? Okay, there are two types of kosher. Ritualistic kosher, what you can taste, touch, and handle, and what you cannot taste, touch, and handle. And then there is moral kosher. So on one level, he does away with the physicality of food issues and touching issues, but then says, where does defilement come from? It doesn't come from the outside. It comes from the internal form, the internal dynamic of your conscience and your heart which is where the Torah should be living. Where does sin come from? Does sin, uh, does sin or non-observance of Torah, which is what sin is, does that exist in the action or in the disposition of the person before the action ever takes place? It deals with the disposition. <laughs> The internal form is where sin lies or virtue lies, not in the external form. Though, yes, it is true, there's a certain facticity of that, that if you have something in the mind and heart that's good or evil, it, 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 it is going to be uh, made real. It's, it, it's going to be incarnated in those actions. That is true. But the, but the moral disposition, the intentionality, of the acting moral agent. We human beings are self-autonomous acting moral agents. Self-autonomy, we are free and, and we act, we choose. And moral, we know the good from evil, evil from good. And hopefully the election of freedom helps us to understand let's choose the good and avoid evil. But the point here is, Jesus says, defilement is not up. It's, it, it's in you. You can defile yourself by your disposition. So he does away with ritualistic kosher, but by no means does he do away with moral kosher. He says the following. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, it is what comes out of a person that defiles. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within and they are what defile a person. That list I just got finished reading. Does that sound familiar? That's the Torah. That's part of the Ten Commandments. Non-observance of the Ten Commandments, non-observance non of Torah in the disposition of your, of your being, of your heart, that is what defiles you. Not what you taste, touch, and handle. This does not go over well. I will tell you that right now. This does not go over well. These are one of the things that got, that got Jesus into all sorts of difficulty. So on one level, you can have your crab salad you can have your barbecued pork and whatever you want. 
okay? But you're going to be judged not by the external activity of your conscience, but the internal form, the disposition of your conscience, because that's where good and evil reside. That's where blessing resides. That's where curse resides. That's where truth resides or, is, or its opposite resides. That's where belief resides or apostasy resides. Do you get the point here? Observance of Torah. Observance of God's law. And yes, does Jesus change Torah in a sense? In this specific case, I would say he changes Torah. Ritualistic kosher is abandoned, but moral kosher, the internal form, is emphasized. Now, it is true in, in the ancient religion of Israel, yes, there's the external form and the internal form. That is true. Judaism tends to emphasize the external form. You are a Jew by how you acted. So if you kept kosher, you were a good Jew. If you kept the commandments, if you kept the 613 mitzvahs to the best of your ability, you were an acting moral agent. You were a good Jew. You were truly an observant Jew. So emphasis was always on the external form, good as that is. However, they did not leave out the internal dynamic. Okay. And Jesus simply wants to say, you, in your emphasis, in the externalization of the faith, good as that is, by the way, don't forget the internalization of the faith, your disposition. You choose to follow God or, or you choose not to follow God. So by the time it is articulated and incarnated in your action, the good or evil that flows from that action is already present within you. Deal with that first. Deal with, deal with your dispositions first. And then what comes out of you in action and in word will reveal the faith that you believe in or the opposite. So this is the type of thing that got Jesus into all sorts of difficulty. Okay, let's move on. Our last example is Mark chapter nine, verses 14 to 29, the healing with the boy with the unclean spirit. This is a very interesting dynamic. This is uh, the, uh, the last healing that we will be covering during this presentation. <clears throat> Mark chapter nine, verses 14 to 29. When they, came to the, when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd round about them and some of the scribes arguing with them. And when the whole crowd saw him, namely Jesus, they were immediately overcome with awe and they ran forward to greet him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about? Someone from the crowd said, teacher, or rabbi, teacher, master, I brought my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him to the ground. And he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. Sounds like epilepsy, okay? And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. So this is, again, they believe there is some unclean spirit that has attached himself to this, to this little boy. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. And he answered them, you faithless generation. This is one of the situations in Mark's gospel that Jesus has had enough. He's had enough of, of the inability to listen to the truth. He's had enough with disbelief. He's had enough of people demanding signs and wonders, but yet in order to have a sign and wonder within the synoptic tradition, the presupposition is faith. If there's no faith, there is no sign. Okay? You faithless generation, 
How much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I have to put up with you? He is having a very angry moment. Bring him to me. Bring the child to me. And when the and they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately he convulsed the boy and he fell to the ground, rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the father, How long has this been happening to him? From, from his childhood, the father said. It often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. And then this key line here, this, this, this phrase. But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. I love the phrase. This, but, if you're, but if you are able to do anything, what do you mean if I'm able to do anything? You know what I can do. Haven't you heard? But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who, who believes. So why are you coming to me? You have to come to me in the, in the posture of belief and faith. So don't tell me, well, you know, if, if you can do something, we'd be happy to have, you know, please have, please have pity upon me. What are, you, what are you asking me to do? Don't you have enough faith to think that I can do something, that the very thing that you want me to do that I can do? But don't, don't stand back and say, well, we really don't know, but so if you can, we'd be happy. What do you mean if I can? Do you want your son healed or not? Where's your faith? Jesus is not happy here. Immediately the father cried out, I believe, help my disbelief. Good, you're on the right road. I do believe. I'm sorry, help my unbelief. Jesus saw the crowd came running together and he rebuked the unclean spirit saying to it, you spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him horribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse. So most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand. Okay. Just like Peter's mother-in-law. Just like the little girl belonging to the synagogue leader. Take him by the hand. Okay. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he was able to stand. And when he entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And this is Mark. And he said to them, this kind can only be uh, cast out by prayer. In Matthew's gospel, very different. Uh, this is Matthew uh, chapter 17, verse 19. The disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, because of your little faith. For I truly, I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed and, and you say to this mountain, move, and it will be moved. Nothing will be impossible for you. So in Mark, uh, because you didn't pray as you ought, and in Matthew, you have little faith. A very interesting dynamic. It's very clear from this episode, uh, Jesus is getting to the point where he's preaching and teaching. He has people running to them. They are amazed. They are astounded by him. But some of them still aren't getting the message. And so he simply says, look, uh, this is an unfaithful generation. My father is giving you the Torah, the prophets, the wisdom literature. You have your own land, your own theocracy, your own self-identity as a people. 
as a nation. You have the temple. You have temple sacrifice. You know how to worship. You know, you have the wisdom that comes from my father. And I am that wisdom in human form. I might have. That's what he's saying. What does it take for you to understand? That's why going back to the issue of defilement, he, uh, he, he, he gets upset with his disciples. Uh, Jesus explained to us the parable about the kosher. He says, are you also without understanding? I guess we are. Don't you understand what I've been saying? Nothing from the outside enters you can defile you. And then here with the man with his son, You've asked me to cure. Uh, first, first you asked my disciples to cure your son, and they couldn't do it because they don't have enough faith and they don't have prayer to do it. You asked me to do it, and you have the audacity to say, "Well, if you can help us, please help us." What do you mean? Why are you asking me? So Jesus is, at least in Mark's gospel, is a very emotional Jesus. He he's simply saying, "Look, this is what it is." to honor God. This is what it means to be faithfully obedient. This is what it means to understand what I'm saying. This is what it means to be faithful. You know, moral kosher, not just ritualistic kosher, moral kosher, that's what counts. Your disposition, your faith, that's what counts. The, tr the tradition of the elders, the oral Torah, rabbinical law, are all necessary things, okay? He's not doing away with it, but he's putting it in a proper perspective, okay? You got to keep that in mind. He is not against the tradition of the elders. He's not against rabbinical law. He's against the fact that you have superseded with theological gravity uh, human tradition over Torah, one of the commandments. So he's very clear about that. You know, have faith and have faith that God has wonderfully revealed in the historicity of Israel through law, prophets, and wisdom writing who and what God is and our relationship with him. So ritualistic culture, good as it was, now needs to be put on an on another level of application and understanding. There's a new level, there's a new understanding. It's not the external form, it's the internal form. It's moral kosher over ritualistic kosher. And that's why Jesus has the audacity to say, thus he made all foods clean. And it's that type of articulation, the new jurisprudence about the Torah uh, and the gravity of uh, o obeying Torah that gets them into all sorts of difficulty. This would not have gone down well. Okay. So there we are. Uh, and then with, with, with the boy that was possessed by the unclean spirit, convulsing and all of that, uh, Jesus wants to restore. That spirit wanted to harm that child, but he couldn't kill him. That's the providence of God. It's not the providence of the demonic. And Jesus has power over the demonic. And he frees him. He, he casts him out. And there's a wholeness now. One thing about Christ in Mark's gospel, he's about restoration, bringing wholeness to the human condition. And in order to see the activity of God in your life, the presupposition is one of faith. And for us Roman Catholics, faith and reason go hand in hand. The God of our intellect, the God of our will, is also the God of our faith and our belief. They are not in contradiction. They are in unison with each other. Okay, I now like to open up uh, for question and answer period. Uh, Brian, go ahead, please. Sure thing. 
Uh, so um, if you have any questions, just please raise your hand or if you have a comment. Uh, Steve, if you have a question, just please type it in the chat box. Elaine and Lance, go ahead. Uh, I have a question for you, Father. Yes, Lance, go we ahead. Went through most of the Synoptic Gospels, um, Jesus speaks in parables to, uh, if you will, the landed gentry. To the to in most, he doesn't do so to his disciples. He only does so to his, uh, to the people, to the, the normal Jewish uh, person, or even to Gentiles towards the other parts of the Synoptic Gospels. And I'm, I just say that in Mark, it seems like in the example we just talked about with uh, the disciples not understanding why they couldn't heal. Yeah. Uh, they they had listened to the parable, I think, and not the, you know what I'm saying? He usually tells them what they need to believe. So Normally to in the synoptic tradition, especially when I covered parables uh, last week at um, uh, Anacortes, uh, he will use the parabolic discourse because it's analogous, it's it's simile, God is like, or the activity of God is like. So that's a simile. He will, because parables are always open-ended. He seldom defines what a parable is, except with regards to this good seed. That's the only time that he will specify that. But all the other parables are left wide open for various uh, roles of interpretation and application. And then, in the uh, Gospel of Matthew, for example, Jesus will explain privately to his disciples right. the hidden treasures concerning the kingdom of God. But for the laity, for, for others, he will speak parabolically because whenever you have a parable, he wants you, to, the story itself, the episode itself challenges you to think, where do I stand in proximity to God when I see myself, for example, with the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, he's in the ditch with the man that has been robbed. Where am I? So parables, uh, parables are there to get you thinking, okay, what would I do? How is God present? And it's wide open. The interpretation of teaching, uh, Jesus will, will in fact elucidate with his own disciples. Uh, and yeah, there are times in which, like like this evening, when he talked about kosher, they're not getting it. Yeah. And, and so it's later. You see, for us, we've had two thousand years to be exposed to this, but they're hearing it for the first time. And it's only after Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit enlightens the apostles and the disciples to the true meaning of what Jesus has said. Because, because in John's gospel, at the Last Supper, chapter 14, Jesus says, I will send you the spirit. Being the spirit of truth, he will recall everything that I've said to you, and he will guide you into all things. Those three points. So he, the Holy Spirit, being the spirit of truth, will recall to mind everything that I've said, and will guide you in the application of the, of the teaching that I've given you. And for us Roman Catholics, that is the charism of indefectibility. Okay, so uh, so so at this point, uh, yeah, the uh, twelve apostles and others weren't getting it. It's only after Pentecost is there a uh, there's a further uh, there's a further clarity. And so at this time, Jesus had not given his disciples the ability to cure. Uh, well, it all depends. He, in fact, sends them out two by two. And, and they come back saying, we use your name. And by using your name, we cast out demons. And we heal people in your name. So, so, so depending on the contextual framework of what part of uh, the sacred scriptures you are reading, sometimes it works. Uh, they have the faith, they have the understanding. Other times, 
like now they don't yeah so yeah. I, when i read that i thought well did they did they try to heal this person in his name and failed or yeah, did yeah. they just not yeah get uh the, the uh text doesn't say that i yeah. mean so the text is very is very ambiguous one thing is very sure in Matthew, you couldn't heal them because of your lack of faith. And in Mark, because you did not pray well. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Lance. Yep. Anyone else? Thank you for the question, Lance. Yes, we have a question from uh, Steve. I'll read it to you, Father. It says, were the Pharisees ever frightened by Jesus? What he was doing was clearly supernatural, yet they seemed to treat him as a regular false prophet. Yeah, uh, this is that's a great question. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, it's very clear that if a prophet comes along the life of Israel and he's saying follow another god or gives a interpretation of Torah or the prophets that is not satisfactory, that is not conducive to belief and not in absolute continuity with the veracity of the living faith of Israel, you are to test that prophet. And if he is, and if he is in fact a false prophet, you are to execute him. You, you are to purge uh, the land of Israel from false prophecy. That is very clear. Now, for some reason, see, and this is what I covered before, the Pharisees had a problem with the authority of Jesus uh, because the way Jesus understood Torah, the way Jesus tried to apply Torah, differed from the classical pharisaical understanding of application. And so at this point, that's why they had to say, wait a minute here, he's doing supernatural things, and yet he differs from us. How do we get around the fact that if we're right, then how come God is working through him? And if we're wrong, why don't we believe in Jesus? And so how do they solve it? Well, he disagrees with us, with our application or with our understanding, and yet he does good things and crowds are being uh, wooed by him and he does wonder works galore, healing the multitudes. The only way they can get out of it says, ah, this Jesus of Nazareth is in league with Beelzebub and with Satan himself. He is demonic. Uh, and of course, Jesus said, this is absurd. Why would, why would Satan cast out Satan? It makes no difference. But so, so yeah, uh, see, see, it does deal with the fact of preconditioning. How do you perceive the presence of God, the activity of God, as articulated through law, prophecy, and wisdom writings, and then how do you believe that God is presently acting? And how do you make the law of God applicable in a way that does justice to the law without damaging the fundamental integrity of Torah? So that's the question. And uh, the Pharisees believed that this man, where does he get his authority? To, and, and, and and that's one thing that's found in Christianity, and that's one thing found in, in, in ancient Judaism. Who has the legitimate authority to interpret the will of God, the word of God, the, and the Torah of God? By what authority do you do these things, Jesus? See, that, see, that is the pivotal question. Uh, and for the, for the Christian church, for the Catholic church, it is the exact same principle. By what authority, who has the authority to explain interpret and make applicable the message and person of Jesus Christ. And for us Roman Catholics, it is the teaching magisterium, which comes from, by the way, the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin has its origin at Sinai, the great assembly of, of elders. And then Jesus at Caesarea Philippi takes the position of loosing and binding, which was one of the attributes and activity of the Sanhedrin and says, you are now the, you are now the new Sanhedrin. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound on earth, but what, what you should be loosed in heaven shall be loosed in heaven, loosing and binding. So, and of course, teaching magisterium, magister means teaching, means 
teacher. So Jesus takes the legitimate ability and authority to interpret the word of God and hands it over to his 12 apostles to continue in continuity the correct application of God's word. So yeah, it, it's, uh, uh, and it all settles on, uh, do you believe that Jesus, do you believe that Jesus is what he claims to be? That's all. See, and, 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 and this is something that we have to understand clearly, both in the synoptic tradition of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and in John's gospel, they attack Jesus and they say, you have a demon. In John's gospel, surely you are demonic Jesus and you are possessed by a demon. And in the synoptic tradition, you are in league with Beelzebub and Satan. He's either that or he is the son of God. There's no middle ground here. Uh, let's get something straight. Uh, people want to say, well, Jesus was a moral philosopher. He was a religious leader. He was a good man uh, giving some ethical understanding of human existence. Rubbish. He's far more than that. Why would you believe this Jesus simply as a good man when he didn't say that he was a good man? In John's gospel, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's the incarnation. Jesus is not just a moral philosopher. He's not just a, a founder of some religious institute. He is the mind, the voice, the will, the very law, the very, the very mind of God in human form. There's no in between. He's not just a good prophet. He's not just a good moral philosopher. No. I think sacred scripture has it right. He, he either is what he claims to be, the only begotten son, son of God. And first, when he's baptized, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And that's stated by the father. Or he is, in fact, demonic. And we Christians hold that he is the word of God made flesh. So what he says has absolute legitimate validity. That's why we are Christian. He's not just a moral teacher. Good as that might be, no. And he's not just another Buddha. He's not just another Hindu uh, Vedic master. He's not just another Asian Confucius. You know? And he's not another Moses. He's not another Abraham good as that is no he's the incarnate word of god made flesh and there's nothing like jesus there's no one there is no one who is his equal okay any other question uh lance are you raising your hand do you have a question i just wanted to to, to ask uh, that last part that you were talking about they didn't speak of Moses in the early days. I guess Moses never proclaimed to be God. So, never. No, no. He was a prophet. Yeah. Only a prophet. But they they, they respected about him. Judaism, Judaism never deified anybody but God. Period. Yeah. And yet they, they had a man who interpreted Judean law at the time, right? I mean, didn't Moses explain to them what the what god gave god the torah to moses torah. on sinai all right and so he brought that to them and That's correct did not moses who told them what the torah told them what uh, is moses is the prophet of god uh, god gives moses the revelatory self-disclosure of his per of this person and his message through human speech. And then Moses articulates that to the great assembly of elders. Yes. And so, so Moses, is, problem with that. Moses, is, Moses is the prophet of God. Yeah. And they didn't have a problem with that at the time. And, no, no. No. and so Jesus comes along and says, it's somewhere in the synoptic gospel. I can't remember. I'm sure, you know, he says, I didn't come to destroy 
Matthew chapter 5. Yes, yeah. I didn't come to destroy he, the law. He, he makes it clear. I've come not, I've come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill yeah. it. Yes. Plain and simple. Yeah. yeah. He, he, and he is an absolute continuity with the Torah. Yeah. My point. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lance. Yeah. May I, may I ask um, Brian how um, we can access, I see that you've recorded everything and how we could go about going back and viewing the recordings. Oh yes, so um, our communications director, Jay, he puts them all up on YouTube. So uh, if, if you email uh, his account or just check our YouTube page, all of it should be there eventually. Yeah, in yeah. fact, uh, what I, the uh, class this morning is already on YouTube. Oh, okay. Everything's on YouTube. Uh, what I did in uh, Langley, Washington, what I did in Anacortes, Washington, and what I've done with you, it's all on YouTube. And then uh, we, we are off next week, but the next two weeks I'll be in Arizona, Sarahita, Arizona, and, uh, and uh, uh, Vail, Arizona. Then after that, I'm, I'm in two weeks in Bakersfield, all that stuff goes on YouTube. So you can see it at any time. And I would welcome people that even though uh, uh, you don't belong to those parishes, you still have access. Once you have the webinar code, it's there. Mm -hmm. And I would ask you to, you know, you know, as I said earlier, you guys are fellow evangelizers. So anything that you can get from these presentations, by all means, share them. I would really, uh, ask you to do that because we are fellow evangelizers. Okay? Yes. Yeah, so um, it'll be available on our website. There'll be a link somewhere uh, later in the week and then you can access everything through there. All right. Uh, Father, it looks like there's no more questions. So if you'd like- Okay. Well, folks, it's been a pleasure uh, being being with you this week. Uh, and my, my parting shot is you are fellow evangelizers. Whatever you have learned this past week, you know, take it to heart, think about it, pray about it, meditate on it, and to the best of your ability, pass it on to someone else with joy and with gladness. And so may the word of God, rich as it is, dwell within your hearts this day. God bless you. Good night, everyone. Thank you.